Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, so today we have a wonderful panel on Millie's Guide to Dutch Universities. Uh, my name is Chloe and I'm super excited to be moderating today's panel. Uh, just some background on me, I'm currently taking a gap year right now um, and I'm an incoming freshman at Brown. So similar to you guys, uh, I came from an international school background um, and I worked with Millie too in high school. So. Uh, hopefully that gives you guys a good background of me, but of course, back to today's panel, uh, Millie is a company dedicated to building a global community for international school students. If you haven't heard of us before, we host a lot of panels like these that are careers oriented and we get um, panelists with expertise to come on and share their ideas and perspectives, uh, and we do webinars every weekend. So if you're interested in joining any events, you can follow us on our Instagram at Millie underscore group for any updates, and feel free to check out our website as well. So for today's panel, we have some pre-prepared questions for 45 minutes, and then after that we will have a 15-minute Q&A session. But feel free to pop your questions in the chat anytime, and then we'll get to them um, as soon as possible. So today we are joined with four amazing panelists um, who will give you some awesome insight into their university lifestyles and also post-grad and what they've been up to. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, panelists, we're going to follow this order as we go along. We're going to start with Azalea, then Robin, Adinda, and then Mateo. So Azalea, can you start us off by telling us more about your background? Um, tell us your name, uh, university, your current job, if you're working, the city you're in, and then one fun fact about yourself. Thank you so much, Chloe. And you know, welcome to all the students who are uh, joining this panel today. My name is Azalea Rosley. I'm from Malaysia and I'm currently in Kuala Lumpur. Um, although I was previously in Ireland and before that in the Netherlands, um, which is why I'm on this panel. Uh, I did my degree in history with a specialization in international relations. And one fun fact about me is that I went to four international schools for my education. So um, yeah, if there's any other international school uh, students here or on the panel, yeah, we're in good company. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Robin Lazala. I'm originally from Dubai, born and raised, but originally, originally from the Philippines. Um, I currently live in Amsterdam, but had studied prior in Seattle. Um, I'm currently working at an advertising company here in Amsterdam. I studied communication science at the University of Amsterdam. Um, and one fun fact about myself is that I make music on the side. Um, so hello everyone, um, welcome. So my name's uh, Adinda Oscar. Usually people just call me Dinda, so feel free to call me that. I am currently studying economics and business economics, uh, specializing in finance um, it, at the University of Amsterdam. I am currently living in Amsterdam as well. Um, I work uh, in UFA as well as a teaching assistant for um, tutoring first year students and uh, very little, oh, I'm from Indonesia, so I also went to a international school, like I think most of you did. Um, and one fun fact about me is that my bench press PR is 24 kilograms. I know that's not a lot, but I've progressed from 10 to 24 within less than a year. So I'm very proud of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So hello everyone, my name is Matteo. Uh, I am originally from Italy, from the south, and I moved to uh, to the Netherlands to study before my bachelor in Tilburg University. And then I moved to Amsterdam for doing my uh, master in business administration with a track of international business. And I'm currently in Barcelona for an exchange from the uh, master of business administration from, the, uh, from Amsterdam. And uh, fun fact of me is that uh, when I finished my bachelor, I started working for Chanel as an intern. And that was definitely a great opportunity that uh, studying in the Netherlands gave me. Yeah, that's Amazing. it. Awesome. Thank you guys for the background. Seems like we have some really diverse uh, backgrounds and fun facts. So um, it's awesome to have you guys here with us today. So just to start us off, um, let's talk a bit about your university and your university life. So what made you drawn to your university? Why did you choose to apply? Uh, was there a specific factor or specific reasons where you were like, oh, I think this could be the place for me? Azalea? 
Yeah, so I'm realizing now that I think I'm the only one here who didn't go to University of Amsterdam, which like the nickname is Ufa for everybody coming in. So when you hear that, you know, they're talking about University of Amsterdam. I went to Utrecht University, which is like, uh, I've said this so many times, it's like, a, it's a city 30 minutes by train from Amsterdam. So it's not quite, but the Netherlands is so small that like you can get anywhere very easily. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, I did a bachelor's in history uh, with a specialization in international relations. And the reason why I chose this particular degree um, in Utrecht was because they did uh, international relations, but not necessarily from a social science point of view, but for more of like a historical perspective. So I knew that I wanted to do um, IR, but like I wasn't too keen on like the social science part because I'm afraid of math and I'm not afraid of history. So I thought it was really great and it was a pretty unique course that combined the two. So I, yeah, that was primarily the reason why I chose to do my degree in at UU, yeah, as opposed to um, other places in the Netherlands. Um, for me, as I mentioned previously, I actually studied in the US for a year before I moved to Europe. Um, primarily, it was because of financial reasons and being closer to home and also wanting to experience a new city other than the US. But if I had to say um, why I picked UVA and communication science, I just think communications is such a broad range of topics that ranges from internal communications to journalism. And I felt that UVA offered a, a course that, that kind of represented this diversity. Um, I chose a research-based um, background because I wanted to study communications that felt a bit more tangible and quantifiable in terms of how to, you know, um, see the effects of, of media on people. Um, but yeah, that was why I chose to study, aside from also the high ranking of UVA in general um, in Europe. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it wasn't that like clear that I wanted to go to the Netherlands at first because I did apply to the UK specifically I did apply to Cambridge which was really tough I didn't get in there so that was also a bummer I did apply to a couple of universities in the UK where I did get accepted and I wanted to go there but because of financial reasons um, I've also decided to go to the Netherlands um, I did apply to Amsterdam and Groningen um, I got accepted to both, but I decided to choose Amsterdam because firstly the ranking and like the well the prestige of the university and like the researches, um, specifically their business school is very good. Um, and initially I wanted to do like I wasn't certain that I wanted to do finance. So I because some universities that I applied to, it's specifically finance. But at the time, I didn't, I wasn't super sure. That's why I thought UFA was a good idea, like a good choice, because it had like economics, which I was really into. But then I was able to now kind of have some background and then properly pick my specialization. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I jump in? Uh, to what regards myself, I moved, um, the first university where I moved to in the Netherlands was Tilburg University. And I chose Tilburg because it was definitely like one of the highest ranking in the world for business administration together with Rotterdam. And I moved there uh, when I was 18, basically. And I really liked the university. It was very, very, very tough, uh, very academic oriented, very research oriented. And, um, and after that, I moved to Amsterdam for my internship. And then afterwards, uh, I should have gone on exchange to Australia, but because of COVID, uh, it got cancelled. So I was struggling find like something, I don't know, like something to do in my life. And I say like I'm, I was, I'm in Amsterdam. It's an incredible city, so many opportunities. Uh, why should I waste this opportunity and go somewhere else where I had already my friends and everything? So I applied to the master in uh, in Amsterdam at Uva. But my first uh, choice to move to the Netherlands was um, regarded to Tilburg University. And I think the city of Tilburg, it's really small. It's really like a student city. It's not really exciting as Amsterdam. But if you are really like focused on your studies and you, you want to improve your CV, it's definitely the place to go. Okay, amazing. Thank you, guys.
Um, so it sounds like you guys, uh, most of you guys went in with a good idea of what you wanted to major in and what your interests were. Um, and I feel like high school students to navigate. There are so many different people who aren't sure okay, um, what majors to apply for. Um, oh, I don't know if it's just me. Sorry. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can, can now. Can you guys hear me okay now? Okay. <laughs> if you could repeat the okay, question. Thank you guys. Thank you for letting me know. Appreciate it. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was just saying like majors are super difficult to navigate. And as someone that just graduated, I struggle with that too. Um, so I was just wondering how you guys navigated the process of picking majors and how you ultimately decided to um, apply to that subject for your university. Thanks, Robin. Okay, easy answer is that I was good at history and I was at the top of my class. So I was like, why would I not do anything that I wasn't good at, right? But <laughs> uh, a more in-depth answer, and I think this would be more helpful for students. So I did the IB, um, the International Baccalaureate, and that means that you're doing quite a lot of subjects uh, at the same time. So I did have the idea of what I was good at and what I wasn't good at. Um, but for me, it kind of came down to English and history because those were my strong suits. This is what I actually enjoyed doing. I didn't dread uh, going to classes for them or anything, but um, I wasn't really keen on doing like a, a double degree because I know like I also applied to the UK and I know in the UK it's like com that it's possible to do English and history or history and geography, something like that. But I didn't think that I wanted that. So the question was like, how, how do I choose between the two that I like? And um, what I did, and it's also what I'm doing now because I'm also applying to master's, is to go to the university website, go to the course, and look at the actual modules that are being offered by that course. Because once I did the comparison between history and English, I found that I gravitated more towards like the courses that were offered in history uh, bachelors as opposed to English bachelors. And you know, if you're lucky, you have a university which allows you to do like optional modules or mine between the two, there are ways to combine them. And yeah, that's how I decided to, to study uh, history at the university. Um, similar to Azalea, I also did the IB. Um, it, it really kicked off with this one subject in English class that I took where we analyzed like ads and how media affects people. And so I really, really love that class and I love my teacher and it was such an engaging topic. So I was like, why not try and learn more about it? So I think communications is just such an engaging course that really sparked my curiosity. But um, other than that, I also talked to a lot of um, people that were in these professions back home just to get a sense of what kind of industry they worked in and if that was something that I would be interested in. Um, so I would really suggest, you know, talking to people who, who have experience in this and also just, you know, picking their brain about what they like about the field and what they also don't like. Um, so yeah, that was it for me. Um, as for me, I mean, I think similar to Azelia and Robin, I also did the IB. Um, yeah, so I think econ was also one of my kind of stronger suit with business, but I also really enjoyed doing maths. That's why I was thinking about kind of going into, for example, like econometrics or actuarial science. But I also know that I do like maths, but I'm not the greatest at it. So I think those were the factors that I had to weigh in. Um, actually, before I did the IB, I had the IGCSE, and that's where I was still debating between doing kind of something econ adjacent or something with actually science. But I think um, because I was actually quite good at chemistry as well, but I think ultimately I looked into the field a little bit more. So what are like, what were the jobs these degrees offer? And I am not a big like lab person and I, I I know there are plenty other job opportunities but I think I don't want to work in that field I didn't want to work in that field so I thought okay I'm gonna go more towards um, economics and I also like talked to my um to like I guess the study advisors uh, in my high school so I really consulted them um yeah I and I think in picking like oh which one I should do because I was you know, in between business and economics, for example, I think, yeah, the best way is just to go to the university kind of like website, look at the modules and 
um, ultimately, like for me, I actually had an electives in a couple of like business courses, which I really, really enjoyed. So I think these things are are quite flexible, I think, in most universities. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. To what regards myself, I think I hear I'm the only one who did uh, classical public school in Italy. So I did like a scientific uh, high school in Italy, which is uh, very good very challenging and after I finished my high school I I had like a pretty low, good level of English compared to my um, uh, to my classmates and I also had some international experience in UK so I decided that that would have been my uh, my path and I decided to 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 search for international schools to international university in English to study international business and from from the rankings, basically, I, I found that Rotterdam and Tilburg were like one of the best in the world. And also like the value for money for the education you get in the Netherlands. I think it's really hard to to have like some comparables in the world because for Europeans, it's just 2000 euros of fee. I think the first year is even 1000 euros of fee. And then you have like an incredible like you, you, education. It's just uncomparable. And also the opportunity that gives you afterwards, it's just really, really, really great. And so, I mean, I decided business, to study business administration, um, not for any specific reason. Uh, I was not so informed when I when I chose my, my major, to be honest, because uh, I was coming from a really like local background, born and raised in Italy. Um, but I think that afterwards that I did my bachelor, I really liked, I, I did a minor in finance and really liked this, uh, this field. And then I decided to, to apply also for the master in the business administration. And yeah, that's it. Mm. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys. Um, sorry, am I still lagging? Can you guys hear me okay? A little yeah. bit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you guys can can make out my question. Um, okay, that's awesome. Uh, also, I, I did the IB too, so definitely can empath uh, empath empathize. Uh, lots of shared experiences with like the IB grind and the EE. Um, I'm sure our students can also relate. Um, but yeah, so in terms of navigating the, the university process, I'm really curious to hear how you guys um, went about that process and also what it was like compared to your other countries. So I noticed a lot of you guys applied to uh, the UK or the US, for example, which have very different application systems. So I would love for you guys to talk me through what the Dutch university process looked like, if you had specific requirements for your majors, if you had exams that you had to take um, that was sort of separate from your other country applications. So uh, yeah, what did what did your university application process look like? Okay, disclaimer, I applied in 2017. So my like knowledge is relevant to that year. I don't know how much has changed since then. Because okay, so what it was is that when I decided that I wanted to apply to the Netherlands, I was like literally the only person in my graduating year that wanted to go there. So like, nobody else was going to do what I was doing. And then my university counselor as well had like very limited knowledge about applying to the Netherlands, because at that time, it was just like not a very popular destination for at least like Malaysian international school students. So there was like a ton of help for like UK apps. There were a ton of help for US apps. So I was kind of left in the dark um, to do my own things, but it is possible. So if I can do it, you guys can do it too because all the information is online. It can be a bit overwhelming because like it's like all in one go, but if you break it down step by step, most universities ask for the same things. Um, for a history degree, the one that I applied for, we didn't have to do any uh, special exams or um, like, additional information like that. Uh, essay requirements, I didn't have anything like that. Uh, recommendation letters, I think it's like necessary for like all universities. So um, I think my only recommendation, my recommendation for recommendation letters is that like, um, especially if you're an IB student, well, I was lucky because I had a few teachers that I had like quite a close relationship with. So it was like a very natural progression to ask them for a recommendation letter. But I can also give advice, like if you don't have a particular teacher that you're super close to, you can ask the person who uh, supervised your EE, perhaps your extended essay, because they're the ones who like, they recognize your work. They can probably say something meaningful about your, um, I don't know, your, your uh, character or profile as a student. Um, and the one thing that I did want to say, which is probably relevant to 
a lot of international students is that you have to prepare for your English language uh, requirement and that differs to different universities. So some universities accept it if you do your IB, especially if you do it like a higher English or if you get like a high grade for your English uh, subject, but other universities still require you to do your English language test, even if you're fluent in English and even if it's like your first language, it's a bit of a bother, but you should get that prepared um, beforehand because they have like a schedule when you can take the test. So you should yeah, keep that in mind. You probably know this, but it's worth reminding. Um, so yeah, uh, similar to Azalea, I also did the, the application completely on my own. Um, it is overwhelming at first, but it's totally doable because there are steps. So I would also recommend taking it one step at a time. Um, I had applied to uh, UVA when I was in the US, so I was actually transferring. Um, so the first things that I actually checked were my entry visa as an and residence permit first. So I would definitely do that, just check the legality of things and, and if it's doable, if you have an embassy where you are, which you should. Um, and then the next thing I checked was if my credits were transferable. In this case, they weren't, so I kind of had to start <laughs> completely fresh to UVA. Um, but the things that I did have to provide were kind of mathematics and English classes, but because I had already taken some courses and also the IB provided that language proficiency, I didn't have to do an extra language test, but I would definitely check if you need that or if the IB or the courses that you're taking is fine. Um, but uh, aside from that, I don't know if other um, panelists have the same experience, but UVA has a platform called StudyLink, um, which is where you do all of your application process through. Um, so this is where you submit your enrollment, all of your language proficiencies, um, but also your motivation letter. Um, and I think those were the only specific things that I needed to do. Um, but yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, I think it's it's the same still I mean I applied a bit more recently I applied in uh 20 well I think I applied like 2019 which is quite early because I enrolled uh my starting period was 2020 um yeah so I think everything could be done in studio link for all of uh, Dutch universities um and I think for me because I also did the IB I think there weren't any exams required but I know that if you have like a national well, it, it also differs country by country, but sometimes you do require like a math proficiency and also with English. I don't recall if they would would have accepted IB, but I think they would have, um, though I did also submit my IELTS because I think I also just did it uh, as a backup because most universities sometimes ask for it. So, you know, um, and I think from my program, I did have to write a motivation letter and give a recommendation letter. So those are the two things that were required from me. And we did what it, uh, it's called UFA matching. So basically they kind of, so prior, so you're conditionally enrolled, I think. And then, so conditionally accepted, and then you do the matching. And this is where basically it's not a determinant whether you can enroll or not. It's mainly just to kind of give an idea to you if that if the program um, is suitable. So there are like a couple of papers that you receive and then some math questions. And then in the end, uh, you do some like tests and stuff and then they're, they're gonna grade you. And I mean, based off of your grade, they're gonna tell you like, hey, perhaps you wanna consider other majors or perhaps this looks good for you. Um, but yeah, I think that was mostly it. Okay, I will tell you my experience first. So, so um, to what regards the, my enrollment to University of Amsterdam was pretty easy because I already had the bachelor in the Netherlands. So it was just like a matter of paperwork and I got accepted within two weeks, I think, something like that. You only need to meet a certain average, certain GPA, but I already had, so it was not, not a big struggle. The biggest struggle was when I applied from high school to uh, Tilburg University. And uh, I remember that I had to take uh, the IELTS test twice because uh, the first time I didn't have like the um, uh, the um, the appropriate the adequate score per each section of the IELTS test, so I had to retake another time. And they're pretty strict on this. Uh, while I also applied for all numerous fixes programs, so I got rejected from two in Rot 
Rotterdam, no, one in Rotterdam, one in Tilburg. And then I got accepted into, I was in the waiting list of IBA in Tilburg, and then I got accepted into that. But I think so right now they are removing all the numerous fixes. And I think the, um, since 2021, there are no numerous fixes anymore for the programs I did. Uh, so the application is basically free. Uh, the only thing you really need to take care of before going to the Netherlands, besides all the tests and everything, is to find a proper accommodation because it's probably the hardest thing, <laughs> the most challenging thing at, on top of your studies. It's so almost this, possible now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you guys. And a question on, on accommodations is going to come later. I'm sure students would love to hear how you guys all navigated this process. Um, but could we quickly have a hands up on who took um, IELTS in high school? I missed the first half, so uh, I, I didn't really see. Um, can you guys just put your hand up if you did IELTS? Oh, okay. Awesome. Everyone did. Um, so let's just do a really quick fire question. Um, what advice do you have for uh, high school students that are preparing for the IELTS now? Um, and what, how did you approach the prep process? Okay, this is funny because I have to, re I have to redo the IELTS because it expired. Because it expires, apparently. I didn't know that. Um, I think my advice is actually for native English speakers who have to do the IELTS like me. Um, See, there's a difference between uh, sounding fluent as a native speaker and also knowing how to speak to score high on the IELTS because I obviously can speak English. I did my whole education from it from like kindergarten until year 13, but I it was so surprising to me. I, I got a good grade for the IELTS, but my speaking was actually the lowest compared to the rest. And when I just talked to my, I think it was like my counselor or whatever, she was like, yeah, that's actually pretty common for native English speakers because we talk casually because it's a casual-ish type of, well, it wasn't a casual vibe, but apparently I took it as a casual vibe. So it's just like a, something to be aware of if you're a native English speaker, like you can use fancy vocab that you generally wouldn't use in a casual conversation, but like that's gonna, I don't know, like that might help you during your speaking exam. It's like a very niche, it's very niche advice, but this is something that uh, I experienced with the IELTS. Um, actually, now that we're talking about it, I don't think that I took the IELTS, so you guys can skip me. <laughs> um, I actually had the uh, opposite experience from Azalea because, I mean, I'm not a native English speaker, but I mean, at this point, I feel like I am. <laughs> but because um, I actually scored quite high on the speaking, um, but I did also took it like a casual conversation. Because, so I'm not sure if this is like difference in year and supervision or anything. Um, the thing is, perhaps um, maybe like, I don't know, I just took it a bit more seriously. I have no clue because I also forgot how it went. I only remember that he was asking me about my my house it was quite odd uh, an odd experience for me but the yeah so for tips on taking the IELTS is that if you've done the IB um, I'm pretty sure you're able to score quite high on the IELTS I think all you I, I know there are some websites as well that help you with like the other components other than the speaking um, so I think it's it's wise to do that I don't think you need to spend money on um, doing IELTS training I think you know I think doing these things on the website should give you enough insight on how to do it I do recommend watching some YouTube videos on how these interviews are conducted because then I think it just gives you some you know um, it really helps with the nerves and kind of you know give you an idea on how you should speak so mm -hmm. okay to work as myself um the IELTS test, I, as, I tell, as I said before, I needed to, to took twice. I remember I had some problems with the speaking because the place where I did the test didn't use like proper headphones. They we only use like big, I don't know, speakers uh, for all the class. So it was really like kind of a mess to, to, to pass this, the, the listening test. But in general, I think if you come from an international background, it's not really difficult. And also I think Dutch University also have like pretty low uh, acceptance, like a pretty low standards for um, for accepting IELTS. I think it's at least six, which I think if you studied all your life in English, you can definitely pass it. 
Okay, awesome. Thank you guys for the quick tips. I'm sure our students appreciate that. Um, so I'd love to switch gears now, actually, um, back to high school. So that might be quite a few years ago, but let's let's reminisce together. Um, so I would love to ask you guys about your high school experience um, and also what specific experiences you have now that some of you have graduated or you're pretty far into your university studies. Um, what sort of experiences did you have in high school that helped you with the application process or even helped you succeed in university specifically? Azalea, feel free to get started. Yeah, so um, I, so my experience with IB was like pretty stressful because I did one year in one school and then I actually transferred to another school for my second year. And the reason why this is relevant is because I had to do two of my higher level subjects as one, I had to just switch completely. So I went from English literature to English language and literature. And then I had to self-study my higher level history. And the reason why I bring this up is because, because I did this switch, I did a lot of self-study. As in, I didn't go to any history classes for my second year of IB. I just went to the IB common room and I studied my own uh, higher level history. And this is was by far the best thing to prepare me from university because I learned how I learn. And I think even if you don't have to transfer uh, schools like I did, especially now, because if I'm not mistaken, IB students, you've already done your mocks, you're doing your revisions for your exam, right? So right now is the time where you have to figure out what works and what doesn't work for you for studying. You know, are you somebody who has to write stuff down? Are you better to do it on the laptop? Like when I first joined university, I thought that because like I can touch type, I think a lot of people can touch type, but I was like typing away during the lecture it's like, writing down everything, everything that was on the slides because I thought that that was the best way to retain information. But like after, uh, I think like after a week or two, I went back to my high school ways of just like writing the most important bit down by hand and maybe it's old school, but I genuinely think that worked better for me. And this is what I mean, like the best thing that you can do in high school to prepare yourself for university is figure out what works and what doesn't work for you in terms of study style, because like it's such a cliche, but uh, you have to find the self-motivation, the self-discipline to do your studying in university because like nobody's gonna come to your room to check whether you're doing your work or not. Like, you have to do that for yourself. Uh, so for me, I went to an American high school in Dubai, um, and I also did the IB as mentioned previously. Luckily for me, my brother was in my high school and three years older than me, So, and he was also applying to the US and applying to universities. So I was really lucky with having him as kind of like, um, you know, a model for me to follow, but I had great counselors in my high school that kind of already helped us in freshman year of high school, kind of gearing up for, for university. Um, but I think what I did when I was in uni um, in high school was that I tried to do a lot of internships during the summer because I kind of already knew that I was wanting to get into communications. So I did two internships in broadcasting and in the retail sector, so PR and I believe marketing. Um, so that really helped me also like solidify whether or not that's exactly what I wanted to do at university. Um, but if you don't have the chance to do an internship, um, I would really recommend, and I mentioned this as well um, previously, uh, just talking to professionals um, and getting as many tips as possible for, for what kind of industry you're looking into. Um, for me, I think in high school, I was just quite active in like organizing events and stuff. And I was actually um, always like doing some finance things I was managing cash flows whatever um, and I think that's just where I was just like oh I really like doing this I think it's fun and I think that's also sort of why I now kind of go into this like accounting slash finance route um, but yeah it wasn't hasn't always been clear to me that that is the path I want to go to so I think like Robin said I think trying to talk to um, professionals really do help um, like, don't be shy to reach out to people in LinkedIn, like university people or even like really people who are already in the industry. I think they're like super, super approachable most of the time. Um, internship is always a good idea if possible. I did like a month internship in like in, in a bank, um, which was quite interesting because I was relatively young and they couldn't really 
have me do much, but at least that kind of give me an insight about how, you know, the banking sector works and what people like, what do bankers do actually like, you know, uh, what are th- their day-to-day tasks. And I think that was, um, yeah, one of the things that actually helped me kind of figure out the things in uni. Okay. Um, so as I said before, I uh, studied in, in Italy in a um, scientific high school. So uh, it was definitely not uh, international and everybody was Italian and um, but uh, when I was in high school, I was organizing, I was like the representative for the student uh, body and um, we were organizing parties and events and social activities for the whole community of the students of my school, which was the, the biggest one and also for other, other schools. So I always had the, um, the experience of like managing people and managing events and social activities and motivating and I suddenly realized that I, I wanted to study something that was related with management, with business. And when I, I started looking for uh, um, this, the curriculum at the, that university I really found that was perfectly my fit to what was my expectation and my, uh, my, my willingness. And yeah, I think that's that's the main reason, but I didn't have any proper like work experience during, uh, during high school. So it was just like my yeah my my passion to to organize things with my friends and this turns out into my studies at the end. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys for the insight. Um, so sort of on the flip side of that, um, what is one thing do you guys uh, wish you'd had done differently in high school to better prepare you for university? Maybe it's a study technique or um, getting involved in certain things. So what is what is one thing you would tell your high school self if you could go back? Maybe this is a cheat and I hope that the other panelists don't think that I'm taking their answer, but I wish that I had taken some like at least rudimentary basic Dutch language learning thing. Okay, to be fair, you actually don't need to know that much Dutch to get by, especially if you go to Amsterdam, because like, I think when I like the few times that I went to Amsterdam as somebody who lives in Utrecht, I probably heard more English on the streets than I did Dutch. So if you are, if you want to go to Amsterdam and like you don't want to learn Dutch at all, I think you can get by. But especially if you're not going to like a super big international city like Amsterdam or Rotterdam or maybe Den Haag, I'm not sure. But like Utrecht, for example, it has some international students, but I would say I was like probably one of the few that were non-EU international. It's like a distinction. Um, And it was kind of hard for me to like integrate socially within Dutch student life because of that language barrier. I mean, I got by at the supermarket, like public transport, all these things you can get by not doing, not knowing Dutch. And I didn't know Dutch for a long time, but once I made friends with Dutch students and I started to like get over the embarrassment of not knowing a language and like committing myself to sounding like a fool and just getting over it, it really, really helped just my quality of social life in the Netherlands. I was able to connect with more people. I was able to feel more comfortable. I mean, I'm by no means fluent in Dutch whatsoever but even knowing a little bit here and there just makes it easier for you to feel integrated yourself in a conversation so yeah I think even if I had done small things to learn just like basic I don't know you don't even have to do like formal classes like A1 or A2 just knowing a bit of Dutch here and there it like it helps you I think and I think that that would have helped me a lot on the social side of university and not just like the academic side because you yeah because like you if you do an English course don't worry they're not going to like slip some Dutch insight there so you don't have to know it on an academic uh, point. Uh, for me I I honestly wish that I had paid better attention to making meals for myself and learning how to cook. I mean this might be different for everyone I wasn't like the best cook ever so um, one thing about uni life here in in the Netherlands is that it's actually quite independent um, as opposed to the US where you have you know a card where you can get your meals done so you never ever have to cook for yourself. So I wish I had paid more attention to my grandma and mom cooking at home um, and learning how to yeah feed myself properly. <laughs> um, for me, I think it has to be budgeting. Um, because Amsterdam's prices can get quite um, crazy 
like I think the Netherlands in itself, like I, I don't think it's super, super expensive, but it is expensive. Like I think especially if you do live in Amsterdam, the prices like, you know, like just day to day groceries and stuff, especially right now, it's been like increasing. Um, so I think just kind of like having set your priorities better and knowing how to manage your money. Um, and I think this is also something you need to talk about with your parents and also thinking about, oh, are you going to get a part time job or stuff like that? Because I think it's going to come in super, super handy because once you, you know, come here, I know you're I mean, at least for me, I was just very like fascinated by everything. I want to get, you know, I want to go to this restaurant. It looks cute, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, you know, it can come to quite a bit of a shock about how like expensive things can be so I think budgeting and I also agree with Dutch um in Amsterdam at least for my I don't know almost three years of living here I've never had to speak Dutch really to anyone even to my Dutch friends obviously because they all speak perfect English even you know like if I go to Ikea for example some people who are a bit older they can speak English perfectly and they don't mind speaking it as opposed to for example in Germany it's it's less uh, of that but I really do say that if you that that you kind of want to learn just a bit uh no need to no need for it to be formal but just kind of you know to orientate yourself and I don't know it's also kind of fun you know kind of like testing yourself to order something in Dutch I think it it can be really helpful okay um, for me, the biggest shock probably has been with the, with the transportation. So when I was in Italy, of course, I was mm, used to go around by car or by scooter and was everything like, it was easy to go around also because everything was closer and the, the, was, the weather was nice. But I think it's the Netherlands, as soon as you move there, you realize that you, your only mean of transport, the most reliable one is your bike. And whatever the, the weather is looks like, it's raining, it's minus 10, it's windy that's the only way you're gonna go around and sometimes really like um stops you to to go around maybe like to see i don't know to just to have a walk because just the weather is too bad at, and uh, you you don't want to go around by bike and um, so if i would have been more prepared to this maybe like i have some friends who brought the car for example and they were just living like pretty pretty good but also cars in general to have a car it's complicated because you need parking you need to pay a lot of money for the gasoline and also for having like a place to, to park your car so uh, you need to compare all the possible chances of going around like before and i think amsterdam is great because with the public transportation uh, you can just go around like very easily even though it's pretty expensive but uh, at least you don't have to cycle with any weather condition Okay, awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, so we have uh, a Q&A from an audience member, which pivots us really nicely into the university portion and asking you guys more about your experiences. Um, so what was your favorite and least favorite part of studying at your particular university? Okay, so my favorite part about studying at uh, Utrecht is that it's such a nice city like city town you know I mean it's, it's very small compared to Amsterdam but it's really really nice like it's so picturesque um it's really beautiful and like this sounds it sounds uh kind of artificial or like shallow but I swear to god when it's um in the middle of winter and it's like negative two and it's raining and you're having a horrible time being in a city that's so compact and small and you're familiar and and, and you know you're familiar with where things are and uh, it's like the opposite of a big city type of vibe and it's a lot more comfortable and cozy. That was by far my most favorite part about my uh, university experience. I really liked the atmosphere. It was very cozy. Um, the class sizes weren't too huge. You really knew your way around the university. It, it was, uh, especially the history department and the English track as well, it was very uh, small in the sense that you knew everybody and everybody knew you and I really like that type of cozy atmosphere it wasn't I guess it's not the same as like a campus life you would have in the states or something like that but it was cozy enough and I think maybe you can miss that if you're at a bigger university not to diss on um, UFA but I think that might be the case and my least favorite part 
that uh, was kind of a shock, not really a shock to me, but it was very disappointing in um, the sense that I went into university thinking that I would have loved to have a student job at the university, like working at the library or being a teacher assistant or something like that. Um, well, because my university was so small uh, in a sense that they didn't really have a lot of international students, almost all of the student jobs, you had to speak Dutch or like have a working level of Dutch to be able to get those jobs. So um, yeah, it was kind of, uh, kind of a shame uh, uh, and a loss because of that. And another thing that was a bit of a drawback is that um, I was the second year of the English language history course, which means that if that's an indication, there weren't a lot of international students yet in the humanities department. And what that meant was that it was like very limited um, integration for international students, not a lot of uh, associations or clubs that were like able to offer events and things in English. So you kind of didn't have the support from a university point of view for social life the way that you would, let's just say, if you were going to an English speaking university, it would be very easy to join clubs or join after school, like to, uh, after school, <laughs> to join um, different associations. So I didn't really get that at my university. So yeah, I think that was kind of a con for university life. Uh, for me, the, the best part was that student life is just great. It's, it's honestly great. You have so much time to just like figure out what you want to do. Also make a lot of friends, um, particularly about my course. It offered so much variety and flexibility within my course to just study electives and in, in different kinds of subjects that range outside communication. So you're never just bound to that one subject. Um, I think my least favorite part was I was also similar to Azalea, like the second English track for communications. And so there wasn't enough things for international students to do to really get to know each other, but also to integrate with our Dutch counterparts. So that was that was a bit of a challenge. But, you know, when you're in classes with people and also in lectures every week, you'll also get to see more familiar faces and get to make friends that way. Um, and I think another drawback was uh, for communication science is a three year bachelor course. So it's quite intense. Um, and so everything was kind of con condensed into like just one semester, two semesters. Um, in the first semester, we did statistics only. So like it is kind of challenging and very, very intense, but um, I think it's it's worth it. Um, well, I think since I did join quite, um, or attended university quite a bit like later than Azalea and Robin, um, I think there is a bit more like associations who, uh, that accept English speaker and you don't need to speak Dutch. But I mean, I think at least in my faculty, because I'm also not very active in that. Um, it's just I don't feel like. I have the time for that, unfortunately. So I think that's probably one of the things that I can't really say much, but I think it's been kind of like updating that, you know, they they still like they accept more and more like internationals and English uh, speakers. Um, but my favorite part about studying at UFA, particularly in my um, uh, faculty is probably that most of the lectures, I actually feel like it's very, it's, sometimes it's very theoretical but then in in a good way but then there are also courses where I feel like it's very applied and there are a lot of guest lectures so I think the variety of that really gives me like the insight that I really need to know what the industry is going to look like um, and the least favorite part is probably because um, like Robin said it's my program is also three years so it's very very condensed and I think it can get quite stressful especially because now I do have a part-time job as a TA on top of that. It, it's very, very stressful. Um, and like the courses are really, really difficult, I have to say, at least for myself. Um, so I, I don't know if it's like my least favorite part because I do like the challenge, but at the same time, I think it just, it can get quite stressful. And I think that is just, yeah, I don't think anyone would like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I would say the same for me. So I can give you like two pros and two cons for um, one for the University of Tilburg, one for University of Amsterdam. Uh, it's absolutely, yes, the cons is that you have like some periods, like especially in Tilburg, I remember where the 
the academic year was divided into two semesters. So the end of the semester was really crazy. Like the stress, the amount of stress you had to pass all the courses. And also the first year you have to pass at least 42 um, credits out of 60. So it's basically 70% of your courses in order to get accepted to the, uh, to the second year. So if you don't get those credits, they are gonna basically, yeah, uh, you have to drop out of the university. And this give you like a lot of stress, especially in the first year. Um, the pro of Tilburg University, of in general, like Dutch universities, that they challenge you so much and they train you so well to to keep on on time on on all the tasks that you're doing. That you, when you finish studying, you feel like so confident. You do maybe like some work experience. You are so confident in looking for jobs, and you know absolutely your value. And this is something that is really helping me right now. Um, also, like the, um, the collaboration with, with companies, uh, with the partnership that you have, the guest lectures, the, the level in general of the education is very high. And they also train you to, to think critically and not just to learn how to do things because many business schools just teach you like some tools and they don't really develop a critical thinking while in the Netherlands, I think it was really great. Always trying to, to motivate you, to challenge you, to, to have a debate. And it's very nice. To what regards Amsterdam instead, I would say that I really like the thing that the semester was divided into blocks of two months. So every two months, you basically do two exams, and this really helps you to, to be on track on your studies and not be delayed. Or in general, you have less amount of stress during the semester because you constantly work on, on your courses. Um, on the other hand, I would say that University of Amsterdam, considering the, the buildings and infrastructure uh compared to Tilburg, i would say it's a little bit outdated like some quite some buildings which looks pretty old or they're not super modern while in Tilburg, i, th I had the feeling that the campus was just amazing and uh, so yes yeah, it's a little bit pro and cons but i can definitely understand because I'm, the university of amsterdam is the in the center of the city and it's absolutely impossible to build like a, a brand new campus with, with all the infrastructure and green so yeah, that was my, my experience. Okay, super helpful guys. Thank you, thank you for the insight. Um, so actually uh, a personal question for me is, um, seeing as we're all international students um, and I'm about to move to college in September, um, do you guys have any advice for or uh, moving to a new country or getting used to uh, university life and settling in. Uh, I know a lot of our um, students probably have the same question as well. So I would love to learn more about your personal experiences of either moving or navigating a new city um, and a new language in some cases, um, and also any advice you might have for our students. I think I'm very well suited to answer this because I moved to like two new countries. So after my bachelor's, I moved to Dublin to do my PhD. So it was like another new place that I had no connections, no friends. It was like a completely fresh start. And my advice that I tell my sisters as well, who are also international students starting a university, is that the best thing that you can do when you're in like a new environment, you're still figuring things out, is to find like your little sanctuary, whether it's going to your favorite museum or whether it's a coffee shop, or even if you're on campus, if there's like a special study room that you like, or maybe special part of the university that you like, someplace accessible. I mean, it's always nice to go on holidays, but not everybody can go on a holiday during the school day. If you go to that place, it's a place where you can feel calm, it's a place that's like usually a bit more quiet. And I think when you have a sanctuary like that, especially when you're an international student, that can be it can get overwhelming you know even if you're having a great time you love your course you have new friends you're really happy and grateful to be in a new place it's so natural to feel like a fish out of water you're kind of freaking out because you're starting university and you're like oh my gosh it's all real right now it's really good to make time for yourself and to have a space where you can just calm down and like refocus and like settle down again um, for me, it would be try to find your people and your own little community. I mean, being 
away from your own family you won't really have anyone and that sounds really really daunting and sometimes it is very overwhelming especially when school gets stressful it's always important similar to having like a little sanctuary it's great to have people that have your back at all times um, and that can be really scary trying to make new friends especially if you have no idea um, but I always just try to, when I was in that situation, I always just thought, you know, everyone's in a very similar situation to me because I did an international track. So don't think that you're alone in this. There are other people that probably feel the same way. And sometimes you just have to say hi. And I still have friends that I've met the first week of uni. I've been friends with them for over six years now. So I would really suggest to just try and be open and be nice to everyone. Um, I think for me, um, I think definitely get to know people like Azalea and Robin said, but also really look into like make a list about the administrative task that you need to do when you come to a new country. I think that is very important that you like look into like, OK, do you have taxes that you need to pay? Because I was completely clueless that I needed to pay like waste tax here um, and then like look into for example, because I came from Indonesia, I had to do um, tuberculosis um, checkup and stuff like that. So that is something that you really need to like look into because then you have to go to Gerede and then like there, you know, it's, it's a whole lengthy process. And then, you know, like registering yourself in your gemeente or your municipality. So these kinds of things, I think you want to get it done kind of like the first month, if possible, in the Netherlands, like taking your residence permit and all of that, just so that you're settling down. And these things are out of the way because you don't want to, you know, wait too long. And then afterwards, I think, you know, then you can kind of start to relax a bit and kind of, I also really recommend if you are moving, give like some room before, like before you start uni, if you're starting like 1st of September, try if you can, if it's only possible, try to come a little bit, like two weeks, a week before, just so that you can get everything kind of settled in to move in and everything because you are moving to a new country and you're basically carrying your life in a suitcase so I think the unpacking the going to Ikea and all of these things are really important so yeah settle everything within the first month that's what I would say okay um what can I suggest is that you um, as uh as who said um to find a group of friends, like a close group of friends of three, four, five people, which you really trust and which you can spend some time together, even in the bad days when it's cloudy and it's rainy and you have exams and you're stressed. Because it's always nice to, um, to have somebody who's taking the same uh, challenges as you and you can do it together and can motivate together. And it's something that's probably like the greatest um I said that they can I like, get from studying in the Netherlands that they have such a group of friends now they are like all around Europe all around the world and wherever I go I, I know I have like some friend like some some close friends and they really give you like some sense of, of feelings of family and and it's just nice also if you are looking for houses for example it's easier to find an apartment for three four people instead of finding like a studio you're gonna pay much more and it's just nice to to not not to go. The, the thing I will suggest not to go to too many social activities where they're like, oh, I don't know, like weird people or like you don't know, you don't feel comfortable. Just try to build your own strong relationship with uh, with a few people that are close to you, and because they will be the most valuable experience you will bring away from from your study abroad. Okay, amazing. Thank you. Um, so we have one final minute, so let's just make this final question super quick fire. Uh, but we have one final audience Q&A from Sylvia, and she asks, uh, do you think your grades in IB had a big impact on which universities you could apply to? Um, quick answer for me, no, not at all. I don't know if things have changed since um, I applied, but uh, I actually didn't really need a specific score for um I for like universities I just needed to have the diploma itself I don't know whether that's changed or whether that's the same for all courses but for my history course I didn't need a specific grade which was like kind of a waste of time because I really really worked hard on the IV and I really wanted to get my specific score which I did and just fine I mean um that's that's 
that's just how it works. But in my experience, for my particular degree, I did not need a specific IB score. So just with the diploma itself, I was able to apply to all of the courses that I applied to. I have the exact same experience as Azalea. My my grades didn't matter. I know um, for applications to UK schools, it does. But for me, it, it really didn't matter. Um, so yeah, it was fine. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't think it mattered for like at least the Amsterdam. I mean, oh, sorry, the Nether the universities I applied in the Netherlands. The only thing was probably the English and the math, but the math was also not mandatory. So I think for my program, it was just like, oh, if you take math standard level, the recommended grade is like a five or a six. Mm -hmm. But if you do get a lower grade, they're not going to not accept you. They're just going to say you might struggle, but that's fine. So I don't necessarily think anything was mandatory. And I didn't do IB, so I cannot really answer this question. Okay, cool. Thank you, guys. Um, so that about wraps up our panel. Thank you all so much for being here and for sharing. Uh, I noticed there were a few questions that we didn't get to. Uh, accommodations is a big one. So if any of you audience members have specific questions that you do want to ask these amazing panelists, uh, their LinkedIn's and their emails are in the chat now. So feel free to just ping them and ask them. Um, they're happy to give advice. Uh, they probably would have wanted the same thing at the time when they were applying. So feel free to just reach out. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining this panel. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your amazing insights and perspectives and have an amazing day. Bye everyone. Thanks, Chloe.